these four hats. So next then we have chief legislator. So another hat that the president wears, and this is institutional, the Constitution says that he is to recommend to their consideration, there being the legislature, such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. So Constitution Article 2, Section 3. So then, as chief legislator, the president acts as the architect of public policy, both foreign and domestic, and in turn sets the agenda for Congress. So as we discussed in our Congress lecture, the executive and legislative branches share powers by constitutional design, i.e. institutional characteristics, right? It is therefore all but inevitable that each branch will have a hand in the actions of the other. In addition, my previous comments makes it clear that presidents in the 20th century play a far more dominating role in legislative affairs than did their 19th century predecessors. Despite holding few formal legislative powers, modern presidents are typically considered to be the chief legislator. One of the important facts about the president's vigorous role in legislative affairs is that it is expected and even welcomed by Congress. This holds true even if Congress is controlled by the president's political opponents. In an area where presidential involvement is considered essential is the presentation of an annual legislative program to Congress. This presidential laundry list spells out the president's primary legislative priorities using favorable congressional consideration. The last time a president failed to present such an agenda to Congress was in 1953, the first year of the Eisenhower presidency. Following on the heels of presidential activists Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, the more conservative Eisenhower sought adherence to proper principles of balance between the branches. Yet, this presidential restraint provoked sharp criticism from both parties in Congress. A fellow Republican in the House of Representatives admonished the Eisenhower administration when he said, don't expect us to start from scratch on what you people want. That's not the way we do things here. You draft the bills and we work them over. <laughs> oh, really? So, presidential involvement in legislative affairs rests with practice and precedent set by presidents who worked vigorously to extend their influence over national policymaking. The list of so-called activist presidents, such as Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin D. Roosevelt, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, is also a list of presidents who labored to dominate the legislative process in order to realize their ambitious national programs. The very labels that come to be identified with these presidents, such as FDR's New Deal, Kennedy's New Frontier, and Johnson's Great Society, all embodied ambitious legislative agendas. Ambitious presidents do not, however, provide the only explanation for the president's expanded role in legislative matters. This pattern also stems from concerted efforts by Congress to delegate some of its authority by statute to the president and other executive officials, efforts that predate the 20th century. Several factors have encouraged this willing transfer of power by Congress. First, until the 20th century, Congress typically held session for only a few months of the year. Congress thus found it necessary to delegate certain of its powers to the executive to ensure the smooth functioning of governmental programs when it was not in session. Second, the need for flexibility in the timing of legislative policy has often resulted in delegation. For example, Congress voted to renew commercial restrictions against France in 1799 but gave the president the option of ending them, quote, if he shall deem it expedient and consistent with the interest of the United States, close quote. Third, delegation of power to the president occurred as a result of the long tradition of presidents acting as channels for communication with foreign nations, i.e., his role as chief diplomat. For example, an 1822 law barred British West Indies ports from shipping to the United States unless the president received information 
that American ships could enter British ports. Fourth, the President has long been considered the singular representative of the American people in his role as chief citizen, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. As a consequence, many powers have been delegated to the executive by Congress in an attempt to avoid the political fragmentation and controversy that often attend congressional decision making. This was seen, for example, in several attempts to delegate tariff powers to the executive early in the 20th century. Executive responsibility to engage in fact-finding and coordination has also encouraged delegation. This is seen especially in the area of intervention in the economy, and we'll be talking about the president as chief economist here in a little bit. This is where measures designed to stimulate or otherwise direct the economy are directly dependent on the quality and timelines of information available. Since the executive gathers and generates much of this information, it is often proved to be the logical source of timely action. For example, the Federal Pay Comparability Act of 1970 was enacted to ensure that federal pay levels remained roughly comparable with those of similar jobs in the private sector. Such assessments depended on data supplied by several federal bureaus. Based on the data, the President made appropriate recommendations to Congress, although Presidents generally recommend pay levels for federal employees substantially below those of comparable jobs in the private sector. Finally, national emergencies have been an important basis for delegating power to the President. During times of war and economic crisis, the desire for speed and flexibility, respect for presidential expertise, and the innate tendency to seek answers from a benevolent national father figure all contribute to a congressional willingness to give broad powers to the president. So this delegation of congressional powers to the executive, emboldening his role as chief legislator, is a practice that actually extends back to the beginning of the country. And so it is a structural characteristic. For example, in a challenge to the Judiciary Act of 1789 that we're going to talk about in our courts discussion, Chief Justice John Marshall observed that Congress could in fact delegate certain powers to either of the other two branches. Over the last two centuries, Congress has delegated authority in hundreds, perhaps even thousands of instances. To select just one example, in 1934, to select just one example, in 1934, Congress surrendered to the executive considerable authority over an area that dominated more of its time than had any other issue from the Civil War up to that point, the tariff. Congress's preoccupation with the tariff was based on the importance of the revenues it generated for the government, especially before the enactment of the income tax in 1913, and on its profound impact on agriculture, manufacturing, and other sectors of the national economy. A policy of free trade, i.e. few or no tariffs imposed on imported goods, rather than protectionism, which would manifest as substantial fees on imports, could please domestic consumers and foreign manufacturers, but enrage domestic producers and produce worker layoffs, whereas a policy of protectionism could reverse the fortunes of each of these groups. Yet, by the 1930s, Congress came to realize that it could no longer devote legislative time to setting thousands of tariff schedules, a complex and high-pressure task that could easily consume an entire legislative session. Well, with the passage of the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act of 1934, Congress empowered the President to unilaterally raise or lower duties by as much as 50% in exchange for similar concessions from other nations. Congress granted the sweeping authority for a period of three years, but it has been regularly renewed with virtually no suggestion from Congress that the power should ever return to the legislature. You would think that my citing a 1934 case would be so old hat as not to be relevant to our discussion today. Aha, but when we turn to the president as commander in chief and the use of these tariff powers, specifically President Trump in his trade war with China and with the European Union, this 1934 act becomes all too relevant. Especially when you co-join it with his role as chief diplomat and commander-in-chief 
and head of state, you can see how these institutional, structural, and procedural powers coming together, these hats, combine to give the president much more power than originally intended in the Constitution. To pick another example, concern over raising unemployment during the summer of 1991 prompted Congress to pass a bill to extend unemployment benefits past the standard 26 weeks of benefits for up to an additional 20 weeks. President Bush opposed the benefits extension, arguing that the government could not afford the $5.3 billion cost and that the nation was already climbing out of its recession. Well, despite threats of a veto, Congress enacted the measure on August 2nd, and Bush signed the bill shortly thereafter. However, the language of the bill was such that the president could ignore its purpose without actually vetoing it. How does that work? Well, according to the bill, the benefits would only be distributed if the president, after signing the bill into law, declared an emergency. In his signing statement, and we'll talk about signing statements here in a second, Bush announced that he would not declare an emergency, but would sign the bill anyway because at least it demonstrates that I'm concerned. <laughs> well, congressional leaders were fully aware of Bush's intentions, but passed the bill because it would buttress Democratic claims that Republicans were unsympathetic to the plight of the jobless. For our purposes here today, this bill typifies the congressional granting of discretion which often undercuts the institution's power. That is, Congress won the battle by enacting a jobs bill, but lost the war by giving the president complete discretion to decide on his own whether to actually provide the benefits. Well, another area where the president has acquired broad legislative authority is a legislative policy planner. Well, since the end of World War II, Congress has granted to the president specific policy formulating responsibilities. In 1946, for example, Congress passed the Employment Act, which requires the president to continually monitor the economy, provide Congress with annual reports, which is the president's annual economic message, and recommend appropriate government action to resolve economic problems such as inflation and recession. Congress by no means foreclosed its role in economic planning and it has even moved further to enhance its capabilities in this area in recent years, such as the enactment of the Budget and Impoundment Control Act. But the president's hand in economic policymaking was substantially increased. Similar responsibilities were granted to the president over planning, labor policy in the Manpower Development and Training Act, over housing in the Housing and Urban Development Act, over urban growth policy in the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1970, and in other areas, including the environment and national security. Subsequent presidents have not taken an equivalent interest in all these areas. Nevertheless, Congress established a pattern of granting responsibility for long-range policy formulation and coordination to the president by statute instead of assuming for itself the primary policy formulation role. In the process, Congress's own proclivities for policy initiation have, to some extent, atrophied. A good recent example would be what's termed as Obamacare, or as the Affordable Care Act. So this was a policy that President Obama wanted to affect, wanted to see affected. And he introduced it in his State of the Union address, and he worked with the legislature to introduce that legislation, which is why they call it Obamacare. Now we know a law is created by Congress. The president approves it, sure, he, he signs it into law or he vetoes it. Nevertheless, he isn't making legislation that's done in Congress. But he is seen as the chief legislator by virtue of, one, his signing bills into law, the veto, or other tools that the president uses to interpret legislative intent. And so on page 372 of your book, it talks about signing statements. And signing statements are a presidential tool, different from executive orders, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But signing statements take place after the bill is written and lands on the president's desk. The president signs it into law, and then he creates basically a cover memo or a cover letter, a signing statement, a statement he makes as he's signing the bill, 
interpreting the bill, interpreting the legislature's will, interpreting legislative intent. Oftentimes, the president can argue with parts of a piece of legislation by claiming that parts of the law are unconstitutional. And so while the president doesn't veto the bill, he signs it into law, with a signing statement, he's able to direct his bureaucracies to further question the legislation in and of itself. President Bush, George W., used 181 signing statements in his eight years in office. And the great part of them strove to direct the implementation of that law, his interpretation of that law. A good example, you know, from our Chapter 7 discussion on the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, being sued by the nine Western Attorneys General to force the EPA to conduct carbon monoxide emission tests as directed by Congress. The president, in his signing statement of that piece of legislation, soft-pedaled the implementation of the emission monitoring because, one, he felt that there wasn't enough money, but that, two, it would put the kibosh on manufacturing's competitive. So the nine Western Attorneys General sued the EPA to force them to affect the legislation as created by Congress, regardless of the signing statements. A very important tool that the president has at their disposal needs much more in-depth review because it's being used more and more and more to circumvent the pluralistic and constitutional legislative process. And these are called the executive orders. And so, for example, President Joe Biden, in the first few days of his administration, signed 30 executive actions, including halting funding for the construction of President Trump's border wall, reversing Trump's travel ban targeting largely Muslim countries, imposing a mask mandate on federal property, ramping up vaccination supplies, and requiring international travelers to provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test prior to traveling to the United States. And so one rightfully asks, what is an executive order? Is it an institutional, structural, or procedural element? And under which hat does it fall? As the president as chief executive, or as the president as chief legislator? Well, as we're going to see in this quick conversation, all of the above. It is institutional, it is structural, it is procedural, it is the president in his role as chief legislator, chief administrator, and chief executive. Recent presidents have used executive orders and presidential memoranda to take dramatic action, usually there in, during their initial hours and days in office. Moments after delivering his first inaugural address, Ronald Reagan used a presidential memorandum to freeze federal hiring to support his contention that big government was the problem and not the solution. Clinton issued an executive order on ethics while still on Capitol Hill after delivering his first inaugural and then used high visibility presidential memoranda over the next several days to reverse the previous administration's prohibition on abortion counseling. George W. Bush issued three memoranda on his inauguration day, followed by several more in the next week to emphasize high-level policy priorities, including the redefinition of relationships between faith-based programs and the government. These examples and, and myriad more illustrate a long-standing presidential practice using a variety of unilateral instruments or direct administration to accomplish goals, including executive orders, directives, memoranda, proclamations, policy instructions, and interpretations of legislative intent. Well, we know that under a strict interpretation of separation of powers, the Madisonian model, presidents have no direct legislative authority. From the beginning, however, they have issued orders and directives on the basis of Article II. Most modern presidents have followed Theodore Roosevelt's stewardship theory 
of executive power, which holds that Article 2 confers on them the inherent power to take whatever action they deem necessary in the national interest unless prohibited by the Constitution or by law. Executive orders have been a primary means of exercising this broad presidential prerogative power. They are presidential edicts, legal instruments that create or modify laws, procedures, and policies by fiat, and have helped push the boundaries of presidential power by taking advantage of gaps in constitutional and statutory language that allow them to fill the power vacuum and gain control of emerging capabilities. Well, for our purposes today, we understand that reliance on such strategies is especially prominent in crucial policy areas such as civil rights, economic stabilization, and national security, or when conflict with Congress means action cannot be accomplished through legislation. In civil rights, Franklin Roosevelt established a Fair Employment Practices Commission in 1943 to prevent discriminatory hiring by government agencies and military suppliers. In 1948, Harry Truman ended segregation in the armed forces by executive order. In March of 1961, John Kennedy issued a sweeping order creating the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and giving it broad enforcement powers. Lyndon Johnson went further, requiring by executive order preferential hiring of minorities by government contractors. Well, FDR established broad precedent for the use of executive orders to achieve economic stability, and a number of his successors have followed suit. During World War II, he issued executive orders to establish the Office of Price Administration and the Office of Economic Stabilization, and to give them extensive powers over prices, wages, and profits. The OPA also rationed scarce consumer goods such as meat, butter, shoes, tires, and gasoline. As a basis for his action, Roosevelt cited his responsibility to respond to the unlimited emergency created by the war. The Emergency Price Control Act of 1942 provided retroactive statutory endorsement for the establishment of the emergency agencies and the measures they implemented. In the 1970s, in, this, in the face of persistent inflation, Congress passed the Economic Stabilization Act, which authorized the President to issue orders that would control wages and prices, but with few criteria to guide those actions. Nixon issued an executive order imposing a 90-day freeze on non-agricultural wages and prices in establishing the Cost of Living Council to administer their controls. Presidents have also used executive orders and national security directives to guide foreign policy in their role as chief diplomat. In 1942, for example, FDR issued an executive order requiring the internment of all persons of Japanese ancestry living in the Pacific coastal states. 70,000 of them being U.S. citizens. The Supreme Court upheld this massive deprivation of civil liberties on the basis of the Commander-in-Chief Clause. There is some disagreement over whether presidents confronted by Congress controlled by the opposition party will make heavier use of executive orders or not. For example, year-to-year -year totals show that Clinton's use of executive orders actually declined rather than increased when he confronted a hostile Republican Congress after 1995, although he still may have used executive orders as a way to make progress on major policy initiatives. In an exhaustive study of executive orders, Kenneth Meyer traces the pattern of their use from 1936 through present and concludes that the issuance of orders rises and falls in response to significant events. The onset of war, the pandemic, for instance, triggers new administrative arrangements and regulations governing economic controls and wartime or quasi-wartime in the instance of COVID-19 mobilization, just as peace will require their removal.
The focus of the executive orders has also changed over time. Orders dealing with executive branch administration, foreign affairs, and domestic policy increased during the period of 1936 through 2016. Finally, Democrats make more use of executive orders than Republicans. More orders are issued at the end of a term and when the president's support is low than during the opposite condition, and more orders are issued when the president's party is in the congressional majority, which is, as I say, a counterintuitive finding. So, Philip J. Copper argues that the real question should be more about the content than the quantity of such actions and the reasons presidents use them. In particular, recent administrations use presidential memoranda alongside and interchangeably with executive orders. These are the signing statements that I had heard that I had referred to. Unlike executive orders, memoranda and signing statements do not have to be published in the Federal Register in which rules and orders appear, nor is there a procedure for developing them, thereby making them simpler to use. Ultimately, the question will be whether Congress and others will accept such assertions of presidential prerogative. In fact, unilateral presidential action can be reversed, as President Trump is finding, as President Biden took office. Another example, during the Korean War, the Supreme Court invalidated President Truman's seizure of the steel industry on the grounds that he had not used the machinery established in the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 to avert a strike. Well, more recently, we have had the example of successor presidents reversing an action of their predecessors. Whether it's Clinton reversing what the elder Bush did, whether it's the younger Bush reversing what Clinton did, whether it's Obama reversing what Bush did, whether it's Trump reversing what, what Obama did, and now we find what Biden is doing to reverse what Trump did. Easily reversed. The question is, why do they use executive order instead of going through the legislative process as chief legislator? That's what's key here. Because if executive orders are easily reversed, we know that legislation can only be reversed through the courts, which is a much longer, more, much more arduous, and surely more pluralistic model. And just one more quick element of chief legislator, that is the lobbying from within the White House. So in our chapter on interest groups, we discussed intergovernmental lobbying, right? In that, we talked about the Association of Bay Area Governments and the Governor's Association and the mayors. But the White House is also a lobbying organization. The executive in and of itself is an intergovernmental lobbyist. How so? Well, an extensive and effective lobbying effort by the White House in the guise of the president as chief legislator might seem to be only a secondary importance considering the many other ways in which the executive branch is now part of the law-making process, as described herein. Yet, no president seeking to maximize influence can afford to neglect either liaison or flat-out lobbying efforts. Executive lobbying begins, but does not end with the White House. Its legislative liaison office is relatively small. Under the Reagan administration, for example, it consisted of 10 people, five of whom covered the House, four who covered the Senate, and one the liaison head. In addition, extensive liaison work was and is conducted by the Office of Management and Budget, and in particular, its Office of Legislative Reference. The latter's job is to keep track of all bills of any interest to the executive, whether substantial or minor. In addition, each executive department devotes some of its own staff to legislative matters, as agencies have a direct stake in the policy and appropriation actions taken in Congress that we're going to develop quite extensively at the end of this lecture when we introduce or reintroduce the Iron Triangle. So, for example, the Defense Department alone has over 200 staff members assigned as congressional liaisons. Now, the Department of Defense is a bureaucracy, is a cabinet-level position, but we remember that it's part of the executive branch. 
So in effect, you're talking about the president through the Department of Defense having over 200 staff members lobbying Congress. Well, by at least one estimate, the executive branch has as many as 1,500 employees assigned to liaison to lobby Congress. Both the White House and the OMB staff act to coordinate departmental liaison activities. So much executive lobbying consists of routine information gathering, right? This task is important because it dovetails with the two-pronged nature of lobbying that we touched on in Chapter 7, Interest Groups. Lobbyists, whether executive or otherwise, use information to press their case for or against legislation, but members of the legislature also rely on lobbyists for information when they are formulating their own views. Although lobbying by its nature involves presenting a one-sided argument rather than a balanced view, lobbyists are also often experts whose opinions are valued by sympathetic members of Congress. This principle applies to executive lobbyists because they possess not only the expertise, but the added legitimacy of being part of the government. Well, liaison officers must be sensitive to the preferences and leanings of key legislators. For example, in the Carter administration, generally opposed to the use of tax credits as a means of providing incentives. But according to Dan Tate, the Senate liaison chief for Jimmy Carter when he was president, the administration was prepared to accommodate the preference for tax credits among individual senators, such as the chair of the Finance Committee, Understanding that sensitivity to senatorial preferences could later provide political dividends for the administration. And please remember, liaison staff members not only lobby, but also actually engage in policymaking, right? When involved in face-to-face -face bargaining, they often need to make promises and commitments that constitute policy agreements. For example, President Kennedy's liaison head, Lawrence O'Brien, found himself agreeing to a level and amount of coverage of the new proposed minimum wage in a 1961 meeting with congressional leaders without even consulting the White House. The occurrence of such situations means that liaison staff members must be well informed and have the trust and the ear of the president. Liaison or lobbying is often most effective when it does not directly involve the liaison staff. If the liaison staff can succeed in involving key decision makers with each other directly, a favorable and expeditious resolution may be more likely. Similarly, if a key member of Congress adopts and is willing to aggressively promote the president's position, the result is more likely to be favorable to the president. Acting as an institutional insider, a committee chair, for example, can deal effectively with his or her fellow chamber members. The Reagan administration found this when the House Minority Leader, Robert Michael, and the Minority Whip, Trent Lott, were effective congressional point men for key administrative initiatives. Still, any president who ignores the, the lobbying staff does so at the risk of crippling the process of influencing Congress. Well, as was mentioned earlier, then, the inclusion of personal presidential persuasion may be a decisive lobbying force and key to the success of the president's agenda. So lobbying is part of the president's role as chief legislator, using their power, using their prestige, using their bully pulpit, as Teddy Roosevelt was fond of saying, to influence legislators is, in effect, their role as chief legislator bringing us to our next hat, which is president as head of party. And you'll see that president as chief legislator and president as head of party are intrinsically entwined. Another hat that the president wears is as head of party. Now, going back to <laughs> chapter 8 and chapter 9, we know all too well that the president isn't head of party. In chapter 8, we talked about the three-headed dragon, the party in government, the party in organization, and the party in the electorate. That a three-headed dragon is one being, one entity, 
the party with three different heads, each head thinking that it is correct, that it has the right worldview, that it should drive the whole body. And oftentimes, the three-headed dragon means that the heads are in fighting. The heads are sniping and biting at each other. And it isn't until they have a common foe or a common enemy that the three heads are able to focus their will with intent or focus their will toward an end. So when I say that the president is seen as head of party, we take this with a huge grain of salt. Now, if you're a Martian and you land and you say, take me to the head of your Democratic Party, where are you going to take him? I mean, the average person, the mass public would point at the White House because he is the, the most broadly elected politician in the United States. You might point them to the Speaker of the House, neither of which are true. We know that the party is more diffuse. Party in government, party in the electorate, party in organization. But that being said, we're talking about the public perception of the president as head of party. The mass public doesn't appreciate, perhaps fully, the distinction between these three elements of party. So that means that pragmatically or effectively, the president really is head of party. So the president then can't so much sneeze without affecting his party's success or failure. So I give you Richard Nixon and Watergate and the, the flocking away from the Republican Party by the party and the electorate. I give you President George Herbert Walker Bush in 1991, 1992, when by virtue of the recession that the country was facing, the Republican Party scattered away in droves. You remember this from our chapter eight, chapter nine lecture a few weeks ago, right? So what the president does or how successful the president is, is gonna have an effect on their party. You may have heard the term coattails and so if somebody is running for office, can they be swept into office on the president's coattails? In other words, is the president so popular and is seen as a Democrat or the head of the Democratic Party, can I run for office on a Democratic ticket and be swept into office because of the popularity of the president? And anybody who even paid attention with half an ear to the 2020-2021 election cycle would understand President Trump's ability to drive Republicans in Congress to represent his version of the Republican Party. So the central issue now between warring party elements is whether Republicans will continue to organize themselves around fealty to President Trump or whether a broader coalition should be built in the coming years that can welcome both his most avid supporters and those who have condemned his behavior. The scale and shape of the big tent built by Ronald Reagan, nurtured by George W. Bush, but transformed by President Trump, is once again up for grabs. Can I ride on his coattails into office? Conversely, if the president is horribly unpopular, do I distance myself from that political party so as not to have a reverse coattail effect or to be tainted with the same, the same brush? I give you a congressman in Florida, Republican congressman, who had his picture taken with Bill Clinton in order to distance his public from the idea that he was a Republican. Head of party or party in government, as seen by the electorate, but then the head of party, a la the, the chief Democrat, the chief Republican, in the president's relation to Congress. Is he really the head of party? When the president wants to get the Democratic Party in line, is he able to direct the, the efforts of the Democratic Party in Congress? Is he really head of party in the government? Obviously not, because there are so many diverse factions within the Democratic Party, even more so now in the Republican Party, that the president is unable to direct the, the activities of the party in the legislature to his end. There's just not that much oomph. So you would say, but Mike, the president is of the Democratic Party, the majority, and the Senate is of the Democratic Party. How the heck can he not be successful? It's not that simple. And so a president whose political party controls both houses of Congress begins with an immediate political advantage. 
presidents who have had the greatest success with Congress, including Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson, have used party ties to chamber and committee leaders to cement support for important programs. Sometimes, however, as I'm going to suggest with Woodrow Wilson, presidents run afoul of their own party leaders, such as President Kennedy did when Southern conservative Democrats, who held influential positions in Congress, blocked many of his programs because of ideological differences. President Carter encountered difficulties with members of his own party in Congress because of his lack of experience and that of his staff. Carter would treat each important proposal as a stern test of loyalty to his administration. At the start of his administration, Bill Bills dealing with nuclear arms negotiations, human rights, tax reform, energy, the Panama Canal, welfare, national health insurance, and urban assistance were all pressed as vitally, as equally vital. In all likelihood, no president could have succeeded in realizing the enactment of all those measures. President Carter's mistake was that he made no allowance for failure, and so every failure became a blow to his prestige and further evidence to the Carter team that congressional Democrats were somehow insufficiently loyal. The administration attempted to adjust to these early shocks, but never succeeded in shaking the impression, whether justified or not, that they were amateurish outsiders. Even presidents who find the opposition party in control of Congress may find ways of dealing with partisan differences. President Reagan amassed a series of major successes in his first year in office by relying on the Republican majority in the Senate and a working house majority composed of minority Republicans and about 30 bull weevil Democrats, that is, Southern conservative Democrats who were sympathetic to many of Reagan's objectives. The centerpiece of Reagan's efforts was a controversial three-year tax cut plan which was enacted only a few months after its introduction. Reagan also won passage in 1981 of major shifts in budget priorities, including significant cuts in domestic societal programs and a major increase in defense spending. Although party ties can provide an important advantage to presidents, it's also clear from political patterns since the 1960s that a president lacking partisan majorities in Congress may still be able to log important victories. During the 36-year period from 1932 to 1968, the president's party controlled both houses of Congress for all but eight years. But during the 24-year period from 1968 to 1992, the president's party controlled both houses for only four years. Clearly, Recent presidents have been forced to accept divided party control as the norm rather than the exception. The urge in both parties to avoid legislative stalemate, combined with long-standing deference to the president's preferences regardless of party, have helped minimize the initial handicap of presidents who lack partisan congressional majorities. Presidents have sought and will continue to seek their first allies within their own parties. But, under contemporary conditions of partisan division, party cannot be expected to play the same role that it always has. Yet, even given the potential unifying force of political party and the president as the head of party, its limitations were nicely summarized by presidential scholar Richard Neustadt when he said, What the Constitution separates, our political parties do not combine. And so we turn our attention to the next hat, which is chief economist. Now, this hat is the quintessential procedural hat. It is the result of the combination of institutional and structural characteristics in the executive office that allow the president to act as the chief economist for the nation. Well, the president's role as the manager of the economy dates from Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal with its commitment to use the federal government's power to bring about the recovery from the Great Depression. Keynesian economics and its prescription of increased government spending to compensate for inadequate private spending for investment and consumption provided a theoretical justification for government intervention. 
Ultimately, it was not the New Deal reforms or recovery programs that seemed to end the Depression, rather the huge increase in government spending during World War II. All of the nation's unused productive capacity, capital facilities and human resources, were mobilized to achieve victory, and government borrowing financed much of that mobilization. After the war, Congress passed the Employment Act of 1946, committing the government to the maintenance of maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. This act translated into law the widespread expectation developed during the Roosevelt administration that the government would, would guarantee to the fullest extent possible a prosperous economy. It also made the president primarily responsible for providing economic policy leadership, although it failed to furnish him with any new tools for that task. The Employment Act created the CEA and an accompanying staff to provide professional analysis and advice, and it required the president to report annually to Congress on the condition of the economy and to offer proposals for improving or maintaining its health. Ultimate power over the president's economic proposals, however, still remained with Congress. Well, from the end of World War II until the late 1960s, Presidents and Congress fought each other over economic policy. Truman struggled unsuccessfully with Congress over its desire to reduce wartime taxes, but he was somewhat more effective in controlling the inflation that resulted from spending for the Korean War. Eisenhower's conservative policies tended to prevail over plans of a Democratic Congress to increase domestic spending. The Eisenhower administration was marked by two recessions in 1954 and again in 1958, with a period of economic expansion between them. The Kennedy-Johnson administration fully embraced Keynesian theory, and a 1964 income tax cut had the desired effect of expanding the economy and increasing revenues. It was thought that economic forecasting and management of the economy had developed to the point where fine-tuning of unemployment and inflation rates were possible. In 1966, however, economic conditions began to change. Vietnam War expenditures rose rapidly, the deficit increased, and President Johnson shifted his focus from economic expansion to economic restraint. Congress resisted Johnson's request for higher excise taxes, and for political reasons he refrained from asking for income tax increases fearing that Congress would raise embarrassing questions about the war and its cost on the eve of midterm elections, hence President Johnson serving as head of party. By the time Johnson had requested additional income taxes and Congress had approved a temporary 10% income surtax, the economy had begun a prolonged inflationary period that drastically changed conditions that had been relatively stable since 1946. The, f the first 25 years of the post-World War II period had been characterized by an inflation rate of approximately 3% per year, an unemployment variance between 4 and 8%, and sustained growth in the gross domestic product, the GDP. Presidents since Johnson have had to contend with a changing and frequently intractable economy. Inflation rates crept upward into double digits in the late 1970s and the early 1980s before declining. Unemployment remained high by post-war standards well into the mid-1990s, and the federal budget ran a deficit every year between 1970 and 1997. Underlying these developments, have been systemic factors beyond the control of government, such as the increased dependence of the economy on foreign sources of raw materials, especially of oil, the growing interdependence of the U.S. economy with those of other industrial democracies, i.e. globalization, the declining productivity of the U.S. economy in relation to foreign competition, the growth and maturation of domestic social welfare programs based on statutory entitlements, and a commitment to improve the quality of the physical environment, even at substantial cost to economic growth and productivity. So, presidents do not make macroeconomic policy in a vacuum. 
solely according to economic theories. Their decisions in this crucial area are intensely political and are affected by the consideration of other policy goals, including microeconomic policy, electoral politics, interest group politics, and bureaucratic politics among institutional participants in the policymaking process. So, in a very real sense, the United States is a political economy, as we'll touch on in a future lecture, and the nation is an economic polity. The president is the focal point of the relationships involved in both these entities. So, when we look at policy politics, we understand that the achievement of macroeconomic policy goals is affected by and has an effect on other policy goals, right? That all these hats combine. For example, in his role as commander-in-chief, we understand that national security policy objectives, for example, often have a profound impact on economic policy. For example, in the 1980s, substantial increases in defense spending beginning in fiscal year 1982 reflected the consensus that the U.S. military strength had declined compared with that of the Soviet Union. So this is Reagan in his role as commander-in-chief making these assertions. These increases, however, hindered efforts to balance the budget. The end of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union in late 1991 precipitated a budget struggle over the disposition of the peace dividend. In October of 1990, budget agreements between President Bush and Congress, any reductions in either defense or discretionary domestic spending, were to be devoted to reducing the deficit. We understand that there are interest group politics involved. So, in making economic policy, Presidents are also subjected to pressures from several important interest groups, including business, labor, agriculture, the financial community, the intergovernmental lobby groups, right, the state and local governments, as well as foreign governments. The effect of these interests on policy varies according to the issues and the current economic conditions at home and abroad. Business and labor interests are the most organized, as we remember, and thoroughly entrenched. Businesses use umbrella organizations that we touched on in Chapter 7, such as the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers, to exert influence, as well as industry-based associations, such as the Automobile Manufacturers Association and the American Gas Association. Individual companies, especially large corporations, also try to shape policy. Business usually concentrate their lobbying on the microeconomic policies that specifically affect their operations, but may also be concerned about inflation, tax burdens, and interest rates, areas of macroeconomic policy. Organized labor encompasses such thing as the giant AFL-CIO and a host of independent unions. Its position on macroeconomic policy issues usually contrasts sharply with that of business. Labor, much more worried about unemployment than inflation, supports fiscal stimulation of the economy in periods of recession and opposes the use of monetary restraints to curb inflation. Well, like business, labor takes great interest in microeconomic policy directly affecting its interests, including regulation of labor management relations and regulations in behalf of occupational safety and health. We, are, we know, too, that agricultural interest groups, though shrinking in membership, remain quite diverse. The American Farm Bureau Federation and the National Grange support national conservative politics while the National Farmers Union and the National Farmers Organization often take much more progressive stances. Well, regardless of their ideologies, farm organizations tend to oppose presidential monetary policies that result in high interest rates because the use of credit is an essential feature 
of farm management. Which brings us to the point of understanding what we call the economic sub-presidency. In discharging the role as economic manager, as chief economist, the president seeks to meet popular and elite expectations that their actions will result in a prosperous economy, right? Presidents must develop and implement policies and build support for them in the public and in the Washington community. To accomplish these complex and demanding tasks, presidents need information and advice and administrative assistance to focus energy on major issues, to integrate the policies of their administrations, to take account of all important interests, and maintain the administration's cohesion. This advice and assistance is provided by a set of specialized organizations located in the presidency and in the executive branch, organizations that have been called the economic sub-presidency. All those engaged in making, defining, communicating, and implementing economic policy decisions, whether they act personally or as a part of an institution, are part of this policy-making process. How presidents use the economic sub-presidency varies across administrations and with economic conditions, as we'll show with the presidents Obama and Trump examples here in a second, but this system is central to policy-making and presidential management of the economy. As I'm going to draw out just very quickly here, Staff members of the economic sub-presidency serve in one of four major administrative units, the CEA, the OMB, the Treasury, and the Fed. So the CEA is the Council of Economic Advisors, which has three members appointed by the president and subject to Senate confirmation, plus a small staff of about 35 persons divided evenly between professional economists and support personnel. Traditionally, most CEA members and professional staffers have had extensive experience in business and government. Then we have the Office of Management and Budget. And so this goes to the heart of the president as chief economist, but also chief legislator and head of party. Here's how. Presidents receive economic advice of a different sort from the roughly 500 employees of the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB. Whereas the CEA's primary concern is controlling the business cycle and achieving sustained economic growth, OMB's major focus is allocating resources to federal administrative agencies and their programs through the annual preparation of the president's budget. Its institutional bias is toward holding down spending. It is the principal instrument through which the president fashions the expenditure component of fiscal policy. Additionally, OMB provides economic forecasts to the president and acts as a legislative and regulatory gatekeeper by conducting detailed policy analysis of proposed bills and agency rules, i.e. the fiscal impact of those bills and rules. The third leg is the Treasury Department which is responsible for collecting taxes, managing the national debt, controlling the currency, collecting customs, and handling international monetary affairs, including management of the balance of payments and the value of the dollar in relation to other currencies. With more than 115,000 employees, it is the primary government source of information on revenues, the tax system, and financial markets. It also takes the lead in developing tax bills and steering them through Congress. Finally, finally we have the Fed. <laughs> the Federal Reserve Board is an independent agency charged with responsibility for regulating the money supply and the banking system. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the president in his role as chief administrator and chief executive. Its seven members are appointed by the president to 14-year terms with the consent of the Senate. The president designates one member of the board to act as its chair for a four-year term, but the chair, an important source of institutional influence, 
often serves beyond that limit. Bernanke was a great example. The Fed has three ways of controlling the money supply. The discount rate, or the interest rate charged commercial banks to borrow from the Federal Reserve, reserve requirements, and open market operations, i.e. the buying and selling of government securities that set the federal funds rate. Well, the independence of the Fed, the operational needs and organizational interests of the Treasury Department, and the institutional perspectives of other departments and agencies have led presidents to seek various ways to coordinate economic policy. The cabinet has not been a very satisfactory vehicle for this kind of collective leadership. Instead, presidents have developed a variety of intra-governmental councils and committees designed to provide a cohesive macroeconomic policy and integrate it with other policy objectives. Most of these entities fail to survive the administrations of their creators because subsequent presidents seek mechanisms more compatible with their own operating styles. As I'll show you the difference between the Obama and Trump administration and its views on managing the economy. It's a very good example. And so, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at two distinct instances of the president acting as chief economist. The first concerns the Washington Consensus, globalization, and the 2008-9 recession with President Obama at the helm. And secondly, the trade wars and inherent mercantilism under President Trump's administration. So, as we know, President Obama came into office during the worst recession since the Great Depression. The key source of the recession was clearly the popping of the housing bubble and the ensuing financial crisis. In a matter of months, trillions of dollars of household wealth were destroyed, setting off a rapid decline in consumer spending. The collapse of Lehman Brothers and the runs on money market mutual funds and other financial institutions caused credit spreads to skyrocket and key sources of credit to dry up. Swift action by President George W. Bush through the Federal Reserve and the Treasury in the fall of 2008 helped to avert an all-out panic, but throughout the following winter, stock prices continued to fall and credit standards steadily tightened. The entire financial system was in a state of anxiety and paralysis. President Obama seemed to understand that this was an all-out crisis that required an all-out policy response. Working with Congress as chief legislator and head of party, President Obama's administration took several major actions in the first few months. The first and most important was the American Recovery and Investment Act. So the Recovery Act was a very bold, counter-cyclical fiscal stimulus. It included a $787 billion tax cut and spending program with a total split roughly one-third tax cuts, one-third government investments, and one-third aid to people most directly harmed by the recession, as well as to troubled state and local governments. The administration worked with the Federal Reserve and the FDIC to help repair the financial system. Perhaps the most important action was the stress test that gave a comprehensive evaluation of the health of the nation's 19 largest financial institutions. So this careful scrubbing of the books, together with the government's pledge to fill any identified capital shortfalls that the institutions couldn't fill by raising private capital, helped to restore confidence in the financial system. It also led to a spurt of private capital raising that put our financial institutions on a much more secure footing. Credit spreads decreased substantially and stock prices recovered greatly. Now, the administration also worked to stabilize the housing market and stem the rising tide of foreclosures. The Treasury worked with the Fed to help reduce mortgage interest rates, resulting in lower payments for millions of Americans who refinanced their homes. They also set up a program that helped responsible homeowners facing foreclosure get more manageable mortgage payments. 
These policy actions complemented the Federal Reserve's actions, where monetary policymakers quickly reduced the policy interest rate to nearly zero. They undertook large-scale purchases of government bonds and mortgage-backed securities to further reduce long-term interest rates. And they created programs that successfully restarted some of the securitized lending that had evaporated during the crisis. So this all-out policy response made a huge difference, and the economy recovered, albeit slowly, but it recovered. And so these are examples, then, of President Obama as chief legislator, head of party, but primarily as chief economist, using the powers of the presidency to restart the national economy in this, in this dreadful recession. Our second example of the president as chief economist lay with President Trump's administration and his use of tariffs primarily in waging what he called a trade war. Now, nobody can say that President Trump's implementation of tariffs didn't have an effect, but what confused many people was the nature of and the motivation behind the tactic. Most economists agreed that tariffs are a double-edged sword in the best cases and rarely recommend their use. The trade war struck many as, as strange and at best counterproductive at worst. There was a method to his madness, however. Donald Trump's trade war policies were a hint at mercantilism. So those of you who didn't sleep through history class might remember that the early modern period was shaped in part by an economic theory called mercantilism. We'll touch on this when we touch on IPE in one of our final lectures. Not so much an ideology as a rationalization for policies that countries were implementing, mercantilism drove colonization and imperialism for much of the 17th and 18th centuries before being replaced with laissez-faire capitalism a la Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. The idea of mercantilism was to maximize the value of your exports and minimize the value of your imports in order to increase the amount of wealth your country had. This was accomplished by preventing imports of finished product by means of tariffs, the promotion of domestic manufacturing, and strict control over the monetary supply. These policies were best expressed in France under a gentleman called Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who reorganized the entire French economy to follow mercantilist theories that spread to England subsequently during the 17th century. Well, there's also a significant national security element to mercantilism, since a bad trade deal would reduce your economic standing compared to another country and potentially place you at a military disadvantage over the long run. Well, this enforced the idea that every country was out for themselves and motivated countries to try and maximize the amount of wealth they had, preferably at the expense of everybody else. So this is mercantilism. And so some of the key elements that are used in a mercantilist policy would include Exempting industries from taxes, establishing monopolies, especially in local or colonial markets, granting rewards of some sort to successful producers, and that can include tax breaks, to subsidize the domestic industry. I'm thinking here of the agricultural industry in the United States and the subsidies that came out in the farm bills of 2018. Any government investment in R&D and research or development, the imposition of tariffs, quotes, non-tariff barriers, or prohibitions on the imports of good that competed with domestic manufacturing, the prohibition of the export of tools or capital equipment, and so this would also include forbidding American companies to trade with companies X, Y, or Z, or with countries X, Y, or Z, to prohibit the immigration of skilled labor that would advantage any competing countries, and this would include corporations, 
made up of skilled labor, offshoring perhaps for tax advantages, the granting of state monopolies or allowing an effective monopoly to grow, limiting the wages of the working class, i.e. stopping the advancement of minimum wage legislation, to enable greater profits to stay with the local merchant class, and then any neo-imperialistic actions such as political, military, or economic colonization. And so, taken together, we look at President Trump's statements, which are myriad, and his decisions, which include leaving the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, leaving the Paris Accords, leaving the Iranian Nuclear Treaty, leaving, leaving the Open Skies Treaty, the Trumpian tariff battles and trade war with China and then eventually with the EU, lead us to the conclusion that President Trump's policies might have been inherently mercantilist. Now, why he took that stance, honestly, one might say would be to improve U.S. power. But we understand that President Trump, as head of party, also perhaps sought to win approval with his base, for whom this cry of mercantilism ringing with chauvinism and jingoistic rhetoric and, and frankly, chest beating, seemed to be very attractive and bumped his approval ratings within that targeted demographic. Now, we know that sanctions as well as tariffs serve the end of mercantilism, and so President Trump's use of tariffs and sanctions combined give us examples of his mercantilist seemingly mercantilist policy. We understand that the U.S. Treasury doled out billions of dollars to agricultural exporters who have felt the significant market share in China drop out from under them, especially with soybean. So, the president as chief economist, through the sub-presidency, economic advisors, through his role as chief legislator in introducing the annual budget, through his role as head of party, through his role as commander-in-chief, all of these hats combining, a hat that is effectively non-existent, right? We said it is neither institutional nor structural, therefore it is procedural. We expect the president to work as chief economist when really that's nowhere in his job description. So, we now turn our attention then to the president as chief citizen. This is a very exciting hat that I think you'll enjoy greatly. Now, the main distinction here is between institutional and structural characteristics insofar as being head of state arises from the president's institutional and structural characteristics. Those elements as chief diplomat, commander in chief, head of party, all those hats combined that create him this this honorific head of state. Chief citizen, as I'm going to talk about here in a minute, is actually more procedural. It rises from the fact that the president is the one office holder in the United States who is elected by all the people. Senators are elected by their states, representatives by their districts, judges are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. It's only the president that is elected by all the people. Therefore, the president is the only office who represents all the people. And so when you take his role as head of party and only representing those people who are in his party is a slap in the face to the idea of the president as chief citizen. No, as president, he represents us all, regardless of state, region, religion, gender, party affiliation, whatever. He represents us all. So with that clarification in mind, let's look at the president as chief citizen. The president as chief citizen. So as chief citizen, the president acts as the representative of the people as a whole, working for the public interest, the public interest of the whole nation, not just the constituents of a state, as would a senator, 
or the constituents of a congressional district as would a representative, or just for those who voted for him or her as would a partisan in nature, somebody who sees themselves as representing a political party's interest. So the chief citizen then, I give you then every inaugural address from Thomas Jefferson in 1800 to present. And I've done this research. You can go back and look at every inaugural address. And somewhere in that address is going to be the words, the idea, the philosophy that I represent everybody, regardless of political party. That now that I've been elected president, all the campaign rhetoric of the past is the past. I'm here to represent the people. And so my interests aren't regional, they're not state, nor are they, they party identified. So this is the president speaking as chief citizen. Now, it's in his role then as chief citizen that we look to him for direction in domestic affairs. This is going to help infuse his direction of public policy domestically. If he's going to help direct public policy, he has to do that with an eye clear of party, state, or regional affiliation. His programs, his policy that he is crafting with the legislature, this, this architect of public policy, must be devoid of party identification. And a good way of looking at the president as chief citizen, as we did with the president as chief diplomat, is in travel. So when is the president going out and showing the flag? When is he making appearances and why? What's his intention? What is he trying to achieve? Ah. So we have Truman first, who is nine visits outside the Beltway as a yearly average. In his second term, he's doing 13. So yeah, the first term, the man's busy. He doesn't have a lot of time for making public appearances. Second term, 13. Eisenhower in his first term, 19. Second term, 11. So almost, almost half in his second term than in his first term. Why would that be? Why would he have almost half as many visits in his first term? Any ideas? Why is he out there? What's he doing? He's acting as chief citizen. He's, he's making speeches, right? He's making public appearances. Why? To what end? In his first term as opposed to his second term. Re-election. Re-election. Thank you, right? He's getting himself re-elected. So the president then is out there. He's stumping. He's making campaign speeches. He's being seen as the chief citizen. Right? So he's running for office in his first term. And this we're going to see again and again when you look at Nixon's first and Nixon's second, Reagan's first and Reagan's second. They're going to drop precipitously. Now, also, if you look at Ford, he's going to go from Nixon's 21 to Ford's 83. So what's going on with Ford? Now, this is ancient history to you guys. But Nixon resigned in disgrace, yes? Watergate. And so the president then needs to bolster the reputation of the presidency. And the president being seen as chief citizen, coming out onto the stage in person, making a personal appearance, has great psychological effect. Has anybody ever seen a president? It's very rare that you actually see a president. I think I spotted George W. once in a limousine, I think. (laughs) Might have been a decoy, I'm not sure. But the idea of actually seeing the president is very exciting. Just like when we see the queen. Why do people wait like in droves right, to see the queen drive by? Oh my god, the queen's coming, right? Ah, why do we do that? What psychological element is it of us that wants to see that? That's that star power, that head of state. But really, it's rallying behind the president for Ford specifically. It's more about repairing the image of the presidency, getting that star power, getting that excitement around the presidency again, because it was seriously rocked by, by Nixon's resignation. Uh, But what you suggest, so you look at Johnson, and I said that Johnson in his foreign travel was almost half, right, of Kennedy. Now, sure, Johnson came in, there was a lot of civil unrest, there were um, civil rights issues, he was trying to invoke or create the Great Society. The man had his hands full. He also had the rise of Vietnam, right, and he had a lot of political unrest as well. So what he's trying to do then in traveling domestically, 49 visits as opposed to Kennedy's 32 visits. Now, these are annualized, so it doesn't take into account that he was assassinated at the end of his first term. Nevertheless, what we're looking at is Johnson's using his star power, getting out there and showing the, the face of the president to achieve a political end. In this instance, to bolster the presidency by right, following Kennedy's assassination, but also because of the civil unrest, to direct people to his civil agenda, to his policy agenda domestic. Do you approve of the president's 
job performance. Do you approve of the president's job performance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Affordable Care Act, vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam, vis-a-vis -vis the conclusion of World War II, Watergate, Korea, the recession, the Khmer Rouge? What elements of the question are happening at the time to affect a president's popularity? So a president's popularity speaks directly to his, the idea of chief citizen. As chief citizen, do we, the public, the American public, approve or disapprove of his job performance? How we feel about the president's job performance is indicative of how we view him as chief citizen. So then we have, if you start with President Truman, you'll see that there's a dip. So what's going on here? Korea. And getting into Korea and the idea that the president isn't doing a, a good job to keep us out of Korea or to keep us out of a new conflict. You have then Eisenhower, who's fairly stable, Kennedy, who's fairly stable. Then you have Johnson and the dip in Johnson going down to a low of 35% approval rating. You have Nixon in the beginning starting out very high following Johnson, but then coming down to a low of 23% with Watergate. Then you have Ford starting out very high very high. Ford started out at 74% approval rating, but then dipped to a low of 37%. So it was the idea of rally behind the president, support the president in this time of, of national uncertainty, Watergate, the resignation of Nixon, but that, that support only lasts so long. People will only entertain that for so long. Then you have Carter, who starts out relatively high. He has a high of 75, but then a low of 28. You have Reagan, who in his term goes from a high of 68 to a low of 35. And you have a couple of dips. The main dip is a recession in 1982, 1983. So the president, as the architect of public policy, is also seen also as the chief economist. And if there is a recession or any kind of, an economic, any kind of economic turmoil, the president is going to get the heat for it. Now, we know that the president actually has very little power, very little control at all in affecting or correcting the ills of the economy. People perceive him as chief citizen as being all-powerful. Why the hell aren't you fixing this? And so his popularity is going to go into the tank, as, as we're going to see in Bush. So if you look at Bush's ratings, he goes from a 90% approval rating. This is George Herbert Walker Bush, the father. 92% approval rating. Now, this is following Desert Shield entering into Kuwait. The idea of the president as commander-in-chief and rallying behind the military effort. So a high of 92% in 1990, 1991, but then him losing his bid for re-election to Bill Clinton in the next year with a 19% approval rating, that precipitous, precipitous fall. The Ford's dip was because of the Khmer Rouge and the Cambodian hostages. You have recession, you have Vietnam, you have Watergate, Korea, presidential popularity the vicissitudes of popular support for the president ebb and flow. Military campaigns, personal foibles, the recession, the economy, they'll all drive presidential popularity. Next, I give you Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations. So, here's the story. Woodrow Wilson, in concluding World War I, now, he didn't want us to get into World War I. Actually, he ran on the, the platform that he was going to keep us out of war but saw himself dragged into war, regardless of any isolationist proclivities within the population at the time. In other words, people didn't want to get into the war. It's Europe. It's not us. We're isolationist. It's over there. It doesn't affect us. Stay the hell out of the war. But because of entangling alliances, Wilson eventually had to get the nation into the war. But in concluding the war, Wilson saw a great opportunity to create an organization, an international understanding to forestall war in the future. And so he had 14 points. His 14 points were to create an organization, international organization, uh, an agreement among nations, the League of Nations, that would forestall with such international wars in the future. So here's how. Wilson went off to Paris, to Versailles, to help hammer out the Treaty of Versailles that concluded World War I. And he used his firepower, his, his role as head of state, his role as commander-in-chief, his role as chief diplomat. He used these roles so that when he, landed, when he landed at Paris, he was able to sit with Vittorio Orlando 
from Italy, and David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister from England, uh, Clement Co from France. Wilson was able to sit with these big four and hammer out this, this League of Nations. And he was successful with his 14 points with the world leaders. But then he had to come home, and he had to convince the Senate in his role as chief diplomat, he had to work with the Senate for the advice and consent of the Senate to approve the Treaty of Versailles. So he's using his hats to affect the treaty and to hammer out the treaty internationally, but now he needs to come home and convince the Senate that it's the right thing to do. So although Wilson had succeeded in creating the League of Nations and meeting many of the goals outlined in his 14 points, his battles were not yet over. Indeed, at that point, they had barely begun. According to the Constitution, as I'm saying, Wilson still had to convince the required two-thirds, because it has to be a supermajority of the Senate, to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. If he failed to acquire the necessary 67 votes, the peace that he had fought so, whole, so ardently would die. Wilson's fight with the Senate was uphill all the way. The Senate did not like the idea of the League of Nations. They were concerned about giving away American autonomy and American sovereignty, and it was also a battle of party. The Senate at the time was primarily Republican, and Wilson was a Democrat. Many of its members, the Senate, were isolationists, and few were unwilling to entangle the United States in international agreements that would either change American sovereignty or draw the nation into another European war. So many in the Senate had deep reservations, to say the least which is cool. This is the way the mechanism is intended to work. So Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a Republican and was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, held hearings on the Versailles Treaty for six to eight weeks during the summer of 1919. These hearings proved to be fatal for the treaty. Although Lodge himself was not entirely opposed to the treaty, the six-week debate allowed many other senators opposed to the League to speak out and persuade their colleagues. So the more powerful of these was Hiram Johnson, who would be governor of California, who was a Republican and an isolationist and a progressive. So Wilson's solution was, as chief citizen, to take the treaty and the league to the American people. And so what he did was that he conducted a whistle-stop tour. And so a whistle-stop tour is when you stand on the end of a train on the caboose. You may see pictures of this, where you stand on the end of a caboose and you give a speech at every whistle stop. A whistle stop, now we're used to trains stopping at train stations, right? But especially in rural areas, there's what's called a whistle stop where there's an intersection between the tracks and a road perhaps. The train stops, they blow the whistle, and people know that the train is going to stop there and they get on or off, right? So that you don't have to build a station at every juncture that you can just do a whistle stop. So in a whistle stop tour then, a politician would stand on the end of the caboose and give um, a speech to a, a small group of people. Wilson is using the star power he has, the personal charisma of the presidency, to attract crowds at these whistle stops and to convince them, as chief citizen, to put pressure on the Senate to approve the treaty. And so Wilson is going to conduct these uh, whistle-stop tours to his health's detriment. So though Wilson received a lukewarm reception at every stop, by the time they had spoken to the citizens, they almost invariably ended with cheering roars, that he was convincing them. He was speaking to them about the Treaty of Versailles. They were skeptical but that by the end of his speeches, generally, they were receptive. They were approving of it. So he, his, his speeches were successful, but he had delivered nearly 40 speeches in half as many days, so two speeches a day for 20 days, over 8,000 miles. He was a university professor. He was a poli-sci professor. Right? I'm sure he didn't go to the gym every day, but he was ruining his health. This was too arduous on his physical being. It was too much for him physically, and he collapsed in Pueblo, Colorado um, in September of 1919. A week later, back in Washington, D.C., he suffered a stroke, and he was paralyzed on his left side and remained paralyzed pretty much for the rest of his life. His wife, Edith, who he married in the White House while in office, acted as an intermediary between the president 
and his cabinet officers and the media kind of protecting the, the, the information that he was paralyzed, that he was incapacitated. Again, we're looking at when do hats combine to help a president and when do they hurt a president's ability to get his job done or get his point across. We have commander-in-chief, chief diplomat, chief citizen, head of state. Hammering out the Treaty of Versailles itself, Wilson was successful by using these four hats. But then as chief legislator and as head of party, the president wasn't able to effectively convince the Senate to ratify the treaty as proposed. So even though he was chief legislator and he, he wanted to affect this foreign policy, he was unable to. So what had he had hammered out in Versailles failed because of his inability to get it passed at home in the Senate. The Republicans were in the majority, and as head of party, you would expect that he would at least have had a minority in the Senate, but he was unable to convince his party adherents in the Senate to effectively campaign their counterparts, their Republican counterparts, to approve the treaty. So even as head of party, he wasn't able to, to shift it. He tried to use his role as chief citizen to get the people to support the treaty to the ruination of this house. We're at the level now of when we're beginning to look at chapter, the chapter on the bureaucracy. So take a deep breath. Give me, you guys are with me? Good. This is the Roman god Janus. Anybody familiar with this? The idea that he can see out into the future and into the past is the idea of the having two faces on one head. So it's, a, it's an analogy, it's a metaphor, where you can see in front of you and behind you. Or you can see two views at one time. And so my argument using this metaphor is that the president, in his role as chief administrator and chief executive, is actually two hats, two responsibilities that are, there are eight coin that has two faces, or there are two elements of one role. Here's how. The president, as chief administrator, is speaking to his relationship to Congress. This comes from the Constitution that says, he shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. So Article 2, Section 3, under duties of the president. And so, in his relationship to Congress, the president is the chief administrator. When the president is facing, is responding to, is interrelating with Congress insofar as affecting a piece of legislation, his job is to execute the laws of Congress. But then, the president doesn't do it all himself. He has a vast bureaucracy with literally millions of people, right, the civil service. And so what the president does is he takes the law of Congress and he turns around and now he's the chief executive. He is the head of a vast bureaucracy. This is also an institutional characteristic. It says, the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. The executive power is the power to execute. So, to be faithfully executed is his relationship to Congress. The fact that he can execute it, that he has the constitutional power to execute it, makes him the chief executive. We look then at executive orders. We've already defined these pretty well, but we have to introduce them again here in this capacity as chief administrator and chief executive. Executive orders have the impact of law when they're not contradicted by statutory language. So the president then, as chief executive, can establish executive orders to implement legislation. So in his relationship to the bureaucracy, he can order the bureaucracy to do X, Y, and Z, to take a piece of legislation and affect that, manifest that by expressing orders to his bureaucracy to do X, Y, and Z. So then what he's doing then is he's extending the scope of the legislative delegation because if the legislation is in any way vague, the president has the leeway as chief executive to interpret the legislative intent and affect it according to his interpretation. So, Congress may not know all the particulars and be able to derive all the, the particular elements of implementation of a piece of legislation. Getting down to the nitty gritty, getting down into the weeds, they're not gonna be able to tell the president, and you need to do this and this and this. They say from a 30,000 foot, we want you to do this. The president's job then is to interpret that and express executive orders directing his bureaucracy to affect it. So the president is interpreting legislative intent. 
And in that interpretation, acting as chief legislator again, the president is adding to the conversation that happened in the legislative process. <coughs> if Congress is saying we want this to be achieved and the president is saying here's how, then the result, the product of that, is going to be the combination of the legislature and the executive. When you look at a piece of legislation as it's executed, as it's been implemented, it is the sum total of the legislative and the executive's contribution. The presidency can use implied powers to issue quasi-legislative proclamations, or it looks, it smells like legislation. The executive orders, the EOs, are hard to defend against legislative opposition, because unless the legislature is very specific in their <coughs> listing out exactly how they want to see it implemented, they're giving the president the discretion to implement that. So unless they're specific in saying how it's to be executed, they don't have any room to talk when he executes it. Either tell me how to execute it or let me execute it, but one or the other. So it doesn't survive challenges from the legislature, but where it can survive challenges is from the judiciary. The judiciary can strike down <coughs> executive orders. Now, as we know, as head of party, when the congressional majority and the presidents are of the same party and they agree on goals, Congress delegates much broader authority to president's discretion. When there is a majority in the Congress that is a different party than the president, they tend to be less gracious. They tend to be less forgiving. If you have a strong majority in Congress that is of the same party as the president, they tend to work together so that the majority in Congress knows that the president's already on their side. He's of their mindset. And so they're less specific in the implementation, trusting that the president will will do their will. When it's the other way, when you have the majority in Congress opposite party of the party in the White House, they tend to be much more specific and watch the president much more closely because they can't trust him. He's of a different party. He's of a different mindset. So it's interesting to watch then the rise and fall of executive orders vis-a-vis -vis the party affiliation of the two branches. Bureaucracy is any large complex administrative structure with a hierarchical organization, job specialization, and complex rules. So now I'm going to introduce to Max Weber, right? And so we're talking about Weberian bureaucracy or the Weberian theory of bureaucracies. Max Weber identified bureaucracies, identified bureaucracies as uh, rational legal authority in which legitimacy is seen as coming from a legal order. So the legitimacy of the bureaucrat authority is in the legislative process the legal order of things, the constitutional process whereby a bill becomes a law and the president executes it, that is the rational legal authority for bureaucrats to act. Now, this is going to become very important here in a minute. The majority of modern bureaucratic officials and political leaders represent this type of authority, this rational legal authority. So when you look at our bureaucracy and you look at our, our bureaucratic structure, you can point it back to the legal order or the workings of the Constitution in creating legislation and affecting it. However, while recognizing bureaucracy as the most efficient form of organization, efficient being to get a job done, and as perhaps indispensable to the modern state, it's kind of hard to see how it would be done otherwise, Weber also saw it as a threat to individual freedoms, that the power of the bureaucracy vis-a-vis -vis the liberty of the individual was kind of dicey, it was kind of scary. So for Weber, the implementation of bureaucracies in government was a kind of rationalization in which traditional motivators of behavior were cast aside, instead utilizing traditions, emotions, or values to motivate behavior. In a bureaucracy, you use rational calculation, says Weber. The idea of a bureaucracy is to be fair. So that if you walk into the DMV or you walk into the DMV, you're treated the same. As individual citizens, you don't have any special um, oomph because you're uh, a class or a gender or uh, a race. The idea of bureaucracy is to be blind to the individual implementation. So bureaucracy is intended to be fair. So we look at this college, for example, as a, just a very quick analogy. It is a large, complex administrative structure with a hierarchical organization and job specialization and complex rules whose job it is to institute or to 
guarantee fairness. So in this instance, fairness is both for the employees and the people receiving the good, you guys, right? And so it's a large, yeah, complex administrative structure. <laughs> Anybody know this college? You have your president, you have your vice presidents, you have your deans, you have your department chairs, you have your, your retention tenure promotion committees, you have the associated students, you have the trustees. You, it's very complex. With hierarchical organization, president, vice presidents, deans, department chair, me. <laughs> way down at the bottom. Actually, all right, way down at the bottom. So hierarchical organization. Now, with job specialization means that I'm not going to walk into a chemistry class and start teaching chemistry. My job specialization says that I'm qualified, I've been vetted and I'm qualified to teach these specific classes. Because in fairness then, we're assuring that you guys get a qualified teacher. You guys get somebody who is qualified to present this information and to grade you on understanding the content and complex rules. So our syllabus, our course outline, right? This is what you do to get an A. This is what you do to get a B. So how are the complex rules assuring fairness? You're following the rules. And so your grades will reflect that you're following the rules. So it's intended to be fair. So this is simple. This is poli sci one, right? This is little fish. Let's talk about the Federal Elections Commission. Let's talk about the Federal Communications Commission. Let's talk about big, large bureaucracies that are going to affect the day-to-day lives of then complex rules becomes very important. Good. So then as chief executive, right, in his role to the bureaucracy, the president supervises the bureaucracy that include his executive office, the cabinet level officers, and independent regulatory agencies. All right, now we're cooking the steam. This is the executive office of the president. This is the White House office um, and other elements of the president's personal bureaucracy. So the executive office of the president is one-third of the bureaucracy. Right? It is the most responsive to the president personally. They can be hired and fired by the president without Senate confirmation and without merit system protection. So these people serve the president personally. They're hired and fired by the president, and the Senate has no say. They can't be subpoenaed by Congress to give testimony because of executive privilege, that the executive has to have privileged staff that is unaccountable to the legislature, that the legislature doesn't have oversight of in order to serve the president. So here's some examples, and I'll tell you why. The Office of Management and Budget. So you brought up the idea of you know how, how does the legislature know what the president needs to run the bureaucracy? The president then has an independent office called the Office of Management and Budget that reports to the president solely without congressional interference, congressional oversight. It is the president's office that tells the president what we need to run the country. What kind of money do we need to run the country? Right? So that the president can work with Congress and the appropriations committees in Congress to achieve that. But if the people aren't directly accountable to the president, if there's um, political pressure from Congress or from other entities, then the Office of Management and Budget isn't going to give the president the clear information. The, that information can't be fully trusted. They have to work for the president. They have to be accountable to the president. There are countervailing balances. Congress has its own OMB, right? There's going to be countervailing balances, as I should suggest, but the president needs to have this clarity and this assurance. Another good example is the White House office. You ever see West Wing? All right, so this is the White House office. This is, these are the speech writers, um, the people who are scheduling the president, getting the president from point A to point B, who he's going to meet, who he's not going to meet. The, the actual workings of the White House, the White House office, is part of the executive office. So you can see why those people need to be working for the president and not be beholden to or worried about any kind of congressional oversight. They need to work for the president. So this is one third. They also include the office of the first lady. I mean, the office of the first lady, she does a lot of good work. And the office of the vice president is on here, sure. Now the office of the first lady is part of the executive office as well. So they're part of the conversation in this third of the bureaucracy. All right. Then the second third. Now this you may be more familiar with. The cabinet is the vice president and the heads of the 15 executive departments. 
So we're thinking the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the 15 cabinet level officers that com comprise the, the vast majority of the bureaucracy. These are appointed by the president, but as we know, they need to be confirmed by the Senate. And so if they're confirmed by the Senate, that means that the Senate, at least according to the uh, interpretation of the Supreme Court, has the ability, the authority, the legitimate institutional authority to subpoena cabinet level officers to give testimony. So the institutional authority is to confirm appointments, the structural element is that they can subpoena cabinet-level officers to give testimony. Right? The process, then, is what is executive privilege? Which officers may and which may not be, be given testimony or be forced to give testimony? So why is this important? The president, as commander-in-chief and as the, the, the main arbiter, the main person developing foreign policy, has to have very clear, unquestionable, loyal sources of information. So I'm thinking like the National Security Council. So the National Security Council is a group of people who come together to advise the president on elements of national security, especially foreign security. And so you, remember, you may remember Condoleezza Rice. That name sounds familiar. She was the head of the National Security Council. As the head of the National Security Council, she wasn't subpoenable by Congress. And so Congress wanted to know, oh, they wanted to know what the president knew. Right? And so they wanted to subpoena Condoleezza Rice, but they couldn't because of executive privilege. She worked in the executive office. They could subpoena the Secretary of Defense, the, Dep the Secretary of State, all those guys, but they couldn't get their hands on Condoleezza Rice. So George Bush made a deal. And he gave up Condoleezza Rice and forced her to give testimony before Congress if Congress would backpedal on their insistence of having the Secretary of State give testimony. And so what you're doing is you have the Congress as the premier branch of government questioning the activities of the president through his bureaucracy. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the balance of power evidenced in the Constitution. That is the Madisonian model. Because otherwise you have the president unaccountable, completely unaccountable. Even their bureaucrats is unaccountable. So we have now independent regulatory agencies. So this is a lot of fun. So you have the executive office, the cabinets, and now the independent regulatory agencies. Well, fun to me, right? And so they are progressive by nature. In other words, the intent of independent regulatory agencies was to break the back of overly strong political parties. Too much party influence. I'm thinking Tammany Hall, right, in New York, the turn of the century. Too much party influence, when it drives the boat, excludes pluralism. It excludes discussion and it excludes inclusion of ideas, inclusion of other world views. When it's only one party driving the boat to the exclusion of all others, the public policy reflects that and it's less, it's poorer for the lack of discussion. And so progressive era reforms were meant to break the back of overly strong parties. For example, our senators were originally elected by the state legislators, right? And progressive era reform was to take the election of the senators and give it to the people at large. That was a progressive era reform intended to break the power of parties in state legislatures. So the creation of independent regulatory agencies was the same. It was a progressive invention intended to be unresponsive to, well, presidential influence or political influence. So commissioners, now I'm thinking like the Federal Election Commission, the FTC, the FCC, uh, the FDIC, um, the FDA. These independent regulatory agencies heads must be confirmed by the Senate and they must also possess the statutory qualifications before they can be nominated by the president. So you are the president and you want to nominate a judge. You want to nominate a head of the cabinet. The head of the cabinet doesn't have to be qualified for that job. That's not a part of the confirmation process you do have to have the qualifications to be the head of the Federal Election Commission, right? For example, before the president can actually appoint you. It's part of the process. It's part of the promise of the independent regulatory commissions. They serve fixed terms of office that branch or overlap the president's office. So 
We're going now through some new Independent Regulatory Commission head confirmation hearings. So that the intent of that is to branch terms of office so that all the more they're inured, they're protected, they're filtered from political pressure. Okay, so a really good example that I have for you where the Federal Election Commission denied a request by Tea Party organizations to exclude them from the requirement of naming their donors. So this goes back to the idea of the NAACP versus Alabama. You remember this when we talked about civil rights? The idea that the NAACP's membership roles were being sought by the state of Alabama in 1956. You saw that this was this problem. And so the idea was, can we actually hold private our membership roles? Well, the Federal Election Commission also held that the Socialist Party of America can withhold the names of their donors First, there's only about 17 of them, right? We're not talking about a lot of money, but because it was envisioned that there could be harm done, that the Socialist Party in America was so unpopular that if word got out that I was a donor to the Communist Party, my life might be in danger, that there could be a reaction. And so the Federal Elections Commission allowed an exemption of the Socialist Party from having to report who their contributors were. The Federal Elections Commission denied Tea Party organization's request for a similar exemption, saying, you're different from the Socialist Party, one, by virtue of the number and the amount of money raised. That the Tea Party had raised $150 million, or this Tea Party organization had raised $150 million the threshold of which is pretty high, and the public has a reasonable expectation of knowing who the influences are, who the people behind that are. So the Federal Elections Commission, as an independent regulatory agency, made a determination. Now, this determination could be appealed in court. Nonetheless, it is a quasi-legislative, quasi-executive, quasi-judicial power. Here's how. In this commission hearing, they made policy that said some people can be exempted from the congressional ideal of campaign finance protections. Right? By listing who your contributors are, you're protecting the election process. You're protecting the freedom of information, knowing who's influencing our public officials. The FEC in a quasi-legislative manner said that some people can be exempted. The executive or executing that policy said, and the Socialist Party can be exempted. Then the judicial interpretation is, is this congruent with the con constitutional ideal? Are we in fact serving the public good by doing that? Can we look at our actions and determine our own actions are right or wrong? Now, the judiciary can come and find that their actions were wrong, but it has to go through the judicial process. It can be implemented on the spot. It is implemented on the spot and is in action until the judiciary says otherwise. So the FEC, in making this ruling, exercised quasi, looks like, smells like, quasi-legislative, executive and judicial elements. This was our seminar question. How did the roles of the president add to or detract from the Madisonian model? So, rule number one, always create a thesis statement. So what is your thesis statement? It's a no-brainer. You take off anything that looks like a question mark. And I would argue that these are going to both add and detract. So here's how. The roles of the president add to and detract from the ideal of the Madisonian model. Thesis, introductory paragraph. Paragraph two, define, first, the Madisonian model. Okay, we've done that a number of times. You can just cut and paste it from previous work. Paragraph three, what are the roles of the president? Remember, your reader knows nothing. You're going to have to educate your reader. So don't presume that they know what the roles of the president are. So I've given you nine. I'm not looking for a laundry list, but a thoughtful development of the, the idea that the president has different roles based on institutional, structural, and procedural elements. Good.
Four, paragraph four. Maybe paragraph four and five. You're talking about two and a half to three pages, right? Four and five, how do they add? So I've given you Teddy Roosevelt, and you can use Teddy Roosevelt. There's a, there's a wealth of information out there. Or look at Obamacare. Look at FDR and the New Deal. Look at Johnson and the Great Society. Look at any presidential effort and try to determine what hats were at play when they tried to achieve that. And how did they combine to help? Paragraph 7, 8, maybe 9. How do they detract? So I've given you poor Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations. How about Nixon and Watergate? How about Truman and World War II? How about Johnson and Vietnam? How about Trump and the trade war with China? You're going to find elements of these different roles coming together to, to hamstring, to, to stop the president from being effective. And conclude. How does the Iron Triangle help or hinder the pluralist idea? Well, first question is, what the hell is an Iron Triangle? And the Iron Triangle is the unbreakable, unbendable relationship between Congress, interest groups, and the bureaucracy. So we touched on interest groups in Chapter 7. We touched on Congress. Now we're looking at the bureaucracy. What is the flow of power? What is the flow of support between these? Well, interest groups give to Congress electoral support, electioneering, support for their re-election, both monetarily, but also in engaging the public in discussion and debate, supporting a candidate's re-election. Congress supports the interest groups by providing, allowing friendly legislation and easy oversight. Right, implementing easy oversight. I'm looking at the National Association of Manufacturers, the EPA, and the requirement to monitor carbon monoxide emissions. Congress and the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy, according to the Vavarian model explained in chapter, gets its funding from Congress. And so the Congress is going to support the bureaucracy and bureaucracies that behave well and in turn support Congress by funding uh, their programs and giving them political support when necessary. So how does the bureaucracy affect Congress? By providing policy choices and execution. As I'm going to suggest very quickly here, when Congress is holding hearings, it is the interest groups who are coming in, but it's also going to be the bureaucracies because the bureaucracies are going to have to implement the law. So Congress is going to ask the bureaucracies to give input, to give testimony into a piece of legislation as well. But if the bureaucracy is chiming in with Congress or supporting Congress's end in a piece of legislation, by their support of that piece of legislation, then Congress, you wash my hands, I'll, hash, I'll wash yours. Right? Or back scratching, whatever analogy you want. The bureaucracy supports the interest groups by soft peddling implementation, providing or allowing low regulation, um, and even sometimes special favors. The Interest groups support the bureaucracies by their support in the Congress's deliberation for the bureaucracy's requests. All right. Now, you ready? I have a great example for you. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So we remember uh, Mitt Romney said he was going to get Big Bird. I don't know if you remember that, right? And it was, it was, the idea was there's too much funding for public broadcasting, or public broadcasting is too liberal, or public broadcasting in general. And so I have here, in creating the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in 1967, President Lyndon Baines Johnson gave an address outlining what his vision for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting would be. This is to quote the speech from Lyndon Johnson in signing the legislation into law. He said it was in 1844 that Congress authorized $30,000 for the first telegraph line between Washington and Baltimore. Soon afterward, Samuel Morris sent a stream of dots and dashes over that line to a friend who was waiting. His message was brief, brief and prophetic, and it read, what hath God wrought? Every one of us should feel the same awe and wonderment here today. For today, miracles in communication are our daily routine. Every minute, billions of telegraph messages chatter around the world. They interpret law enforcement conferences and discussions of morality. Billions of signals rush over the ocean floor and fly above the clouds. Radio and television fill the air with sound. Satellites hurl messages thousands of miles in a matter of seconds. 
Today our problem is not making miracles, but managing miracles. We might well ponder a different question. What hath man wrought, and how will man use his inventions? The law that I will sign shortly offers one answer to that question. It announces to the world that our nation wants more than just material wealth. Our nation wants more than a chicken in every pot. We in America have an appetite for excellence, too. While we work every day to produce new goods and to create new wealth, we want most of all to enrich man's spirit. That is the purpose of this act. It will give a wider and, I think, stronger voice to educational radio and television by providing new funds for broadcast facilities. It will launch a major study of television's use in the nation's classrooms and their potential use throughout the world. Finally, and most important, it builds a new institution, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The corporation will assist stations and producers who aim for the best in broadcasting good music, in broadcasting exciting plays, and in broadcasting reports on the whole fascinating range of human activity. It will try to prove that what educates can also be exciting. It will get part of its support from our government, but it will be carefully guarded from government or from party control. It will be free and independent, and it will belong to all of our people. Television is still a young invention, but we have learned already that it has immense, even revolutionary power to change, to change our lives. I hope that those who lead the corporation will direct that power toward the great and not the trivial purposes. At its best, public television would make our nation a replica of the old Greek marketplace, where public affairs took place in view of all the citizens. But in a weak or even an irresponsible hands, it could generate controversy without understanding. It could mislead as well as teach. It could appeal to passions rather than reason. If public television is to fulfill our hopes, then the corporation must be representative, it must be responsible, and it must be long on enlightened leadership. I intend to search this nation to find men that I can nominate, men and women of outstanding ability, to this board of directors. In 1862, the Morrill Act set aside lands in every state, lands which belong to the people, and it set them aside in order to build the land-grant colleges of the nation. So today we rededicate part of the airways, which belong to all the people, and we dedicate them for the enlightenment of all the people. I believe the time has come to stake another claim in the name of all the people, stake a claim based upon the combined resources of communications. I believe the time has come to enlist the computer and the satellite, as well as television and radio, and to enlist them in the cause of education. If we are up to the obligations of the next century, and if we are to be proud of the next century, as we are of the past two centuries, we have got to quit talking so much about what has happened in the past two centuries and start talking about what is going to happen in the next century. So I think we must consider new ways to build a great work network of knowledge, not just a broadcast system, but one that employs every means of sending and storing information that the individual can use. Think of the lives that this would change. The student in a small college could tap the resources of a great university. In 1844, when Henry Thoreau heard about Mr. Morris's telegraph, he made a sour comment about the race for faster communication. Perchance, he warned, the first news which will leak through in the broad, flapping American air will, that, will be that Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough. We do have skeptic comments on occasions but I don't want you to be that skeptic. I do believe that we have important things to say to one another, and we have the wisdom to match our technical genius. In that spirit this morning, I have asked you to come here to be participants with me in this great movement for the next century, the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. A congressional transcript from a subcommittee hearing on whether we should digitize or help the Corporation for Public Broadcasting shift, migrate from analog to digital formats. Pretty simple question. And so what we're talking about is about a $500 million shortfall in the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's funding where they needed to ask Congress for a, an extra bit of money to help them achieve that. Right? And so what we're looking at then is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting 
and a look into public broadcasting in the digital era. And so the con Congress, or what congressional committees were active or participatory in the question of public broadcasting include the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and the Internet of the Committee of Energy and Commerce of the House shares oversight of these bureaucracies that include the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and the National Telecommunications and Information Association at the Department of Commerce. So it's this lower chamber's subcommittee of the Energy Committee that provides oversight for these three bureaucracies in the president's office, in the executive, or in the executive department, the bureaucracies. The Commerce Subcommittee on Communications Technology and the Internet. So this is the Commerce Committee and their subcommittee on Communication Technology and the Internet provides oversight of these bureaucracies in conjunction with the House. So together, the House and the Senate, through these subcommittees of these larger committees, provide oversight to these three bureaucracies, the FCC, the CPB, and the NTIA. Furthermore, because we're talking about broadcasting that goes overseas and not just domestically, a whole other set of congressional committees and subcommittees come into play. So the Committee on Foreign Relations in the Senate and the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the House both have jurisdiction over non-military U.S. international broadcasting. And I'll talk about what those are in a second. The Committees on Appropriations of the House and Senate, because the committees thus far we've been talking about are those that are going to fund the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Where the heck does that money come from? Oh, the Committee on Appropriations of both the House and the Senate are needed to going to find the money that these other committees are going to give to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So they're also in the conversation. So that's six congressional committees that are actively participating in the discussion, the question, should we help digitize the Corporation for Public Broadcasting? So this is the Congress's pluralist model. Then we have the bureaucracy. So we have the Federal Communications Commission that was established by the Communications Act of 1934, charged with regulating interstate and international communications by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable. You have the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That's job is to, that submits an annual report to the President via the Secretary of Commerce, so through the bureaucracy, for transmittal to the Congress, those oversight committees of Congress, to include a comprehensive report of its operations, activities, financial conditions, and accomplishments. Uh, further oversight is achieved as the officers and directors of the corporations are subpoenable to testify before appropriate committees of Congress with respect to such a report. But remember, these are independent regulatory agencies. And so although Congress provides oversight, they are independent. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration of the Department of Commerce is the executive branch's agency that is principally responsible for law, by law, for advising the president on telecommunications and information policy issues. The U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors is the arm of the bureaucracy that looks overseas. So the Corporation for Public Broadcasting as an entity is coordinating, is working with the U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors for the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, the Middle East, to advance democratic transformation across the Middle East, North Africa, um, and other uh, trouble areas, now the interest groups. And this is why I bring this up. In this committee hearing then, what we're talking about is should we digitize public radio, public television? All right, that's the question. But it's our in. And these were the interest groups who were represented at this one committee hearing. The Association of Public Television Stations, so this is an interest group. And remember, everything we talked about in Chapter 7 about interest groups come to play here, their roles and their purposes in a civil society, in a democratic society. Public radio stations, 
the Traditional Values Coalition. What the heck were they doing there? Well, NPR, a reporter from NPR, in investigating the anthrax scare um, of anthrax being mailed to elected representatives, suggested, just suggested, in a report that it might be right-wing Christian groups that may have perpetrated this. He was simply theorizing that it might be the Christian right who would do something like this. And so the Traditional Values Coalition was invited to give testimony at this hearing really about the value of National Public Radio, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and whether the media's liberal bias was such an extent that it ran afoul of their mission of providing even non-political reporting or non-politicized reporting. So the Traditional Values Coalition was able to come to this committee hearing and demand an apology from NPR uh, in context of their funding request for digitization. We're looking at the Iron Triangle. How the Iron Triangle then comes together to help or hinder the pluralist ideal. You have interest groups, you have bureaucracies, and you have Congress. In Chapter 10, we talked about Congress and its pluralistic ideal. The subcommittee, the committee hearings, the how a bill becomes a law process, and how that helps and hinders pluralism. We talked about this in interest groups, how the existence of interest groups helps or hinders. Yes? Now we've talked about bureaucracies and how bureaucracies as a part of the executive department are also, well, independent regulatory agencies filtered from political pressure. Does the Iron Triangle, the invaluable, the unbreakable relationship between Congress, interest groups, and bureaucracies help or hinder the pluralist ideal? Your thesis, obviously, they help and hinder. Paragraph two, what is the pluralist ideal? The more voices, the better, the broader conversation possible. Take the lid off the idea of factions and let everybody say everything in every context, right? Like the traditional values coalition in this. Well, and then does it help or hinder? And so how does the Iron Triangle help? What elements of this unbreakable relationship foster open communication, foster a broader perspective, a broader conversation? How do they hinder? Well, you talk about the idea of special interests and this, this backroom dealing between bureaucracies and Congress and the interest groups, that a lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes. And there you have your wrap-up for the second seminar question, does the Iron Triangle help or hinder the pluralist ideal? So again, in this very long recording, please forgive me, we're actually tackling two seminar questions. This recording covers two chapters in your reading and two weeks in your schedule, hence its length. Usually, for a three-unit class, a lecture should be about two hours and 50 minutes. For a three-hour lecture, it's roughly a three-hour class. And so, unsurprisingly then, this class meeting is stretching a little longer than usual. Again, how do the roles of the presidency add to or detract from the ideal of the Madisonian model? That was our seminar question one, and it is a separate seminar question, and its essay is due on the date established in your platform. The second seminar question, which touches on the bureaucracy. Now, these are combined because, as I've said a hundred times now, the bureaucracy comes under the auspices of the executive, as chief executive, the president controls the bureaucracy. Since the bureaucracy is foundational in the Iron Triangle, then it's not surprising that this seminar question is dovetailed with our examination of the president, of the executive. Oh my goodness, my friends, that brings us to the end of today's lecture on the presidency and bureaucracy. I look forward to reading your essays. Again, thank you for your patience. Again, this is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to United States Government course online. Thank you. Have a great day.